Well, thank you for, for joining today. Again, uh, my name is Dave McKenzie. I've uh, been here at the IU School of Medicine for about three and a half years. Uh, before that, I spent uh, 19 years at Eli Lilly. So I was in the neuroscience discovery division. So I've had a very nice opportunity to come back and kind of set up this uh, uh, de novo behavioral phenotyping core. Um, and I'd like to introduce my, my staff uh, first of all, Katie Fisher, she kind of, uh, she joined with me just a few months after I joined and she's been responsible for kind of overseeing the daily operations of the lab, as well as really establishing and validating many of the assays that we use. So she's been invaluable and in actually starting to get her own research programs up and going as well. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, um, Tim Meyer joined us. Uh, Tim's been amazing. He's basically um, did wolf spider research before for his master's. And so he came in and actually picked up the, the mouse and rat work very quickly. Uh, he's been exceptional at sort of establishing new assays as well and uh, doing study reports. So uh, notebooking and just been phenomenal in helping us get things going. So all the stuff I'm going to be showing you are a result of a lot of their work. Um, so the first thing I want to mention is, you know, what is our mission statement? So the, the behavioral core um, basically provides in vivo behavioral support, physiological support to IUSM, as well as external investigators. And that's a very important point, not just for people with an IU network, but my, my hope is to get more collaborations with Purdue, Notre Dame. Um, and we also work with local biotechs, so we, we, we can do a lot of different things. And the way we work, we can... Um, basically design, execute studies. They can be kind of a fee for service, uh, you know, through we have the pricing through IU Bloomington. You know, they generally translate to about $50, $50 an hour for IU uh, uh, labs. Um, so we kind of calculate it based on how many animals and how big the studies are and so forth. And, and the fee for service works really good. These are more one-off type of studies. Um, but if you have something like a, a grant where over five years you're going to have this particular profiling done, uh, we can do different ways where we can have like a subcontract for the core or, you know, we can be co-investigators. And, and I've lit, to date, I've probably written about 40, 45 letters of support for various grants. So that's one way I think we're, we're, we're really having more of a longer term commitment with uh, various investigators. Um, training is very important to us. Uh, we will train uh, graduate students, uh, undergraduate students as well, postdocs. Um, we come in and we kind of teach them how we, we do things, the, do the validation work. And in some cases, actually, if they have experiment, we let them actually run that in our lab as well. Um, and myself and Katie are, are also available to consult. Say you have a, you know, you got a review back from a grant or a paper about some, you know, behavior that your lab might have done or you that they a suggestion that they want you to do, you know, please contact us and be very happy just to kind of chat through what might be the best behavioral approach to to answer those questions. As far as our setup, we're we're, we're in the Stark Neurosciences Research Building. And we have quite a bit of space, almost 1300 square feet of dedicated testing space. We're on the fourth floor, and we basically compose that we have six uh, independent behavioral rooms uh, encompassing uh, various pieces of equipment, which I'll go into more detail. Uh, I did want to note that we also have, you know, uh, sort of uh, fume hoods in, in two locations. And one thing that we are starting to do more of is more necropsy sort of work. And I think this is very important. Yes, you know, one thing to have a behavioral phenotype but to be able to then take those animals and look at brain or, or other target organ tissue, you know, do that necropsy work and actually correlate behavior with whatever pathological biochemical endpoints that you have. And I'll give you a, a nice example of how we've done this recently. So we have that capability as well. We can draw uh, plasma, uh, brain, uh, other organ tissue. We can look at CSF levels in, in, in mice and rats, so forth. Um, and then we also have space on the fifth floor of our building, which is our video tracking room. Uh, we, we use AMA's uh, video tracking uh, software. We have two cameras in this room. And the, the nice thing about this technology is it basically allows you to have any type of maze uh, set up and it can you know, track the animal's behavior. So it's a very versatile system. I'll give you some examples of how we, we actually use that. So when I set up the behavioral core, um, 
I was trying to think about how do we set this up to be most flexible? You know, whether we're supporting investigators that do neuroscience work, or they might be more interested in cognition versus maybe folks in a uh, musculoskeletal group or oncology where they're more interested in motor or, or pain or sensory processes. You know, uh, people in a diabetes group, you know, can we look at metabolic function, things like that. So with a sort of a finite budget that we had, we, you know, try to establish pieces of equipment that allow us to look at basically five larger domains of behavior, you know, ranging from, you know, sort of basic, you know, motor autonomic consumatory functions. Um, you know, basically, you know, you have a new uh, uh, genetic mouse, for example, what's wrong with my mouse? You know, we can look at basic, you know, frailty functions, motor strength, uh, you know, coordination, we, we have a, and we'll talk more detail about this, we have a home cage telemetry system where we just, in a non-invasive way, we can, we can monitor you know, food, uh, water intake, wheel running behavior. We can put biosensors in to look at autonomic function, all without having to go in and interrupt the animal. So we find this is a very powerful system to have. And then we have various methods and techniques to look at effective reactivity, you know, anxiety, uh, mood alterations, uh, social affiliation, you know, aggressive behavior. Again, this is very, very useful for looking at just general uh, phenotyping of different mice. Um, part of my own research interest is in addiction disorders. So we're kind of building uh, new models of that. We can look at, again, using the telemetry, we can look at continuous, you know, alcohol drinking, you know, versus water or versus sucrose and two bottle access. We can do place preferences. We can look at withdrawal measures, somatic as well as autonomic. I'll give a couple of examples of those. Um, and then we have some traditional sort of uh, assays that are predictive of antidepressant uh, medications, such as four swim tail suspension test. And again, working within the Stark, I work very closely with Bruce Lamb and the Model AD group, where you know we're we're dealing with cognition involved in Alzheimer's disease. There's various various domains of cognition, you know, ranging from non-associative to working memory, long-term memory, you know, uh, neuroanatomical localizations. We have assays that are kind of dependent on amygdala versus hippocampal function versus uh, mesolimbic dopamine activity. So, and again, and and using different reinforcers is important. If you have a mouse that has a phenotype that they're maybe lighter than the wild types, maybe food drive isn't as much. So food may not be a very good reinforcer. So we can use, you know, a mild sh foot shock or escape from a water maze or something like that. So these are considerations when we when we think about what is the best test to use for your particular study. And an area that is an area of growth for us is actually looking at nociceptive behavior. You know, we have a lot of the assays that are, are readily available for this, you know, uh, wheel running, you know, this is a normal activity that mice and rats love. They'll do it without any, you know, special motivation and virtually all different sort of pain perturbations will affect this voluntary behavior. Again, it makes sense. If you're not feeling well, you're not going to go out for a jog or, or run as fast even. So there's all these different parameters that we can look at. And we all have standard assays too. We can look at standard mechanical as well as thermal uh, allodynia or hyperalgesia. Uh, we have some new assays we've developed using um, uh, sort of uh, accelerometers look at flinch activity using sensitivity thresholds for, for uh, mild foot shocks. And at what point do they actually flinch? I'll give you an example of that. So again, these are all assays that we have the capability to do. Now, that said, we have not you know, extensively validated each and every one of those assays just because there hasn't been need yet, but this is sort of our blueprint for assays that we can actually set up. And, and the end goal here is we have these assays and depending on the experimental, genetic or pharmacological manipulation that you want, we have this uh, sort of a menu system that we can, we can derive. You know, if you have a or experimental, if you have an animal that has traumatic brain injury and it's an area that you think you're going to have motor deficits, well, we have a battery of assays that we can use. If this is more something you're looking at cognition or affective disorders, we have assays that we can use and suit based on your paradigm. So the key pieces of equipment that I'll be talking about today 
Um, we have uh, a, a very high capacity uh, photo beam tracking system by Omnitech. Um, and they're coming two flavors. One is uh, the six just general open field activity chambers. I'll talk more about those. And we also have a operant uh, shuttle boxes that are you know, basically for training animals to do sort of res uh, avoidance responses. Um, I already mentioned we have a any maze tracking system that again, it's so flexible and using various mazes we can also use it to track social interactions, uh, you know, that are very useful for, for multiple indications. We have a San Diego Instruments uh, starter activity chambers for basic sensory pre-attentive processing. And we have this uh, TSC systems home case uh, telemetry. Again, this is a, the non-invasive continuous monitoring of various indicators of home cage behavior. So I'll start out just talking a little bit about our, our photo beam uh, animal detection. And again, what I wanna point out is, is the flexibility this has. So here's the, the general sort of chamber. It's got sort of um, uh, very closely spaced photo beams. So as the animal moves, it breaks beams. That's how the animal is tracked. So you have an XY plane here that kind of looks at the ambulatory uh, behavior. And it's also got what we call a Z plane that, that you can configure to look at rearing behavior or, and I'll show you a, an example, if you raise it higher, you can actually look at jumping behavior. And that could be a very important for different sort of readouts that you want. And within this, we've configured it to, we can look at social approach behavior. And again, it, it tracks the animal where they're at. We can look at uh, condition place preference or aversion. We can make it more of a, an anxiety assay by we, we, you know, these are in, in these uh, sound attenuated chambers that we can control the overall lighting level. So we turn the light up really bright, but we also insert in half the chamber, what we call a dark box. It's got a door in the middle they can kind of investigate. So it's a bit much better way to look at sort of uh, exploratory anxiety behaviors. And then we can do classical conditioning, the standard fear conditioning that you have a lighter tone that's paired with a, a foot shock um, and, and again, you can actually discern more maybe amygdala dependent learning based on uh, learning about fear. They show the fear by freezing behavior. And, and that's more to the light and tone versus how they're responding to the overall training context. That'd be more of a hippocampal based uh, sort of learning. And here's just some measures and readouts that we get. And it's very diverse. Um, and we probably you know, need to do some more data mining into these different sort of behaviors. We can get measures of distance traveled, uh, ambulations, which includes things like velocity. So you may have animals that you can look at peak uh, median velocity. So if you have an animal that does a lot of very you know, short jumps and starts across the chamber, this could be a useful measure. We actually find in like opioid withdrawal, this might be a useful uh, measure. Uh, we can rest time that could be interpreted as, um, you know, either an activity or freezing behavior in a, in a fear conditioning paradigm. We look at stereotypic uh, activity. So that could be um, either drug induced that causes repetitive, uh, you know, head uh, weaving or, or grooming behavior, um, you know, that, that can be done by, and again, these certain genotypes, a lot of autistic mice do a lot of grooming behaviors. So this is basically non-ambulatory behaviors this is picking up, as well as just total movements, which is basically no matter where they're at, whatever beam break it has would be a total movement sort of measure. Um, it even is useful, it can actually pick out the centroid of the animal and actually detect turning behavior, uh, certain drugs or certain manipulations. If you, you know, lesion, you know, the, uh, the nigrostriatal pathways is a Parkinson's model with 6-hydroxydopamine. You can give amphetamine, which releases dopamine, or uh, apomorphine, which gets the postsynaptic receptors. You actually get turning behavior in different directions. So this could be a very nice readout. Um, and actually location, you know, are they, are they showing thigmotaxis? Are they wall hugging, for example, which could be an indicator of anxiety as well. And the data can be defined as counts or time doing that behavior. And it can be broken down into user-defined time bins. And you can change that and go back and, and look at the data after the fact. And here are some examples of, you know, here's a, a vehicle mouse and a 30-minute just locomotor activity assessment. 
This is mouse given a psychostimulant, MK801, which is an NMDA antagonist like ketamine or fencyclidine. And, and you can just see that, you know, this is a, a sort of line tracking where they did over this 30 minute period. So much more active over here. And this is our light dark box. Um, and this is very useful if you want to do like a heat map of where is the animal spending their time. Um, you know, here you can see on the dark side, they're spending the majority of their time. And the door here is in the middle. So you can tell there's also a lot of time where they're sort of investigating whether they want to go out in this bright environment. And when they do, you know, they kind of hug the walls out there. So, and, and this actually changes over time. So this is sort of some data over 30 minutes, but one of the measures we use is, you know, how quickly do they get out? And you see this nice gradual increase in exploratory behavior over time. And it's been very sensitive to detecting maybe, you know, anxiogenic or anxiolytic like phenotypes in the mice. And within our chambers, this is for like fear conditioning. If we really want to, you know, change the context that we're in, you know, we can change the visual attributes of the environment with both the light as well as the type of uh, sides on the walls. We change the floors, grid versus maybe a, a solid flooring or shaving flooring. We can have different olfactory cues. And we find that that is sufficient to cause nice, you know, generalization um, from those uh, behaviors. Now, when we, this is just an example of why it's important to look at these different measures. You know, most people just report distance traveled. Um, this is a, a study where we did MK01 um, in mice. And in here between these two uh, doses of 0.1 and 0.3, we're really not seeing a differentiation in terms of the stimulation response in the mice. And, but yes, this is also interesting. We see changes, uh, rotations as a result of given MK to one, but again, no, no change in the, the dose response. Um, unlike amphetamine or other dopaminergic sort of uh, psychomimics, you don't see much stereotypy, uh, stereotypy behavior in, uh, with the NMDA antagonist. Neither do you see a lot of rearing time but when we look at things like total movement time, you do get a nice dose dependence in terms of, of uh, sensitivity to it. And we've kind of used that as, okay, this is a, gonna be a very sensitive measure for looking at antipsychotic reversal of MK to one induced behavior. And here we did a risperidone dose response study blocking the effects um, in, a, in a, a 30 minute session. So again, very useful for defining the type of readout that you want. And again, if we were using some other stimulant, we might go with maybe rearing or stereotypy behaviors, depending on what was most sensitive. Um, another application, this is using the same setup. As I said before, we can change that Z plane to make it higher, is one unique uh, characteristic that mice do when they're going through opioid withdrawal is they actually jump. Um, you don't see this as much in rats, or it, it even has some strain dependency to the mice. But we were looking at the effects of oxycodone and an acute withdrawal induced by the uh, opioid antagonist naloxone. And we, our first study was kind of just validating that we're actually getting good uh, naloxone induced jumping. We see here that we get a lot of jumps. So when the mouse rears up and, and does normal rearing, it wasn't break, breaking, uh, breaking any of those beams. So these are true jumps that are detected uh, sort of objectively with our photo beam system. And this is just a, a dose response study we did with a MGU23 agonist showing that this, this uh, mechanism of action actually reduces uh, some of those withdrawal signs. The other Omnitech system we have is uh, operant shuttle boxes. Again, has a, a pretty broad uh, use uh, for different things. We can look at cognition. Um, there's a paradigm called passive avoidance where you have the two sides and on day one, they're put on one side and, and it's a real bright environment. The door opens and they can go into the dark environment which we think would be safe. They go in there, the door shuts and they get a single foot shock. And then the next day you put them in that same situation, you measure how long does it take them to cross over to the dark side, you know, which was previously shocked the next day. So it's, it's basically a memory consolidation retrieval. If they remember getting that, then they actually show longer latencies to cross. And the figure down here is just a study 
that we did with the IUSM investigator, they basically had an environmental manipulation and they did a drug study to see if their drug would reverse that. And what you can see here is the environmental manipulation caused a deficit in the, in the retention of passive avoidance, but the drug really had no effect. So this was a nice way to sort of look at interaction between environment and pharmacological uh, you know, sort of treatments. We can look at uh, higher order cognitive learning. We can do like go, no go. Basically, if you have a light, it means I have to cross, if I, if I, but if a tone is present, then I stay. That's a very difficult task for a mouse to, to learn. Um, but this is something that is kind of taps into executive function that we can look at. One assay that we run quite regularly is a condition avoidance responding. This actually has a high construct, high predictive validity for detecting novel or, or basically uh, clinically used antipsychotic medications. And I'll show you a figure here. This is an example of uh, two clinically used medications for schizophrenia, risperidone and aripiprazole. And what they do in this assay is we, we train the mice to greater than 85% avoids behavior. Basically, the door opens, a cue is present, and they have 10 seconds to make a shuttle response. If they do that, the trial ends, nothing happens. If they don't, a shock starts, and then they'll, they'll cross over and escape. So they learn this very rapidly. What's interesting is there's a very unique pharmacological response antipsychotics to is that they, the, the animal will actually wait around, the doors open, they have that 10 second period, they won't make an avoidance response until the shock comes on and then they'll cross. And it has excellent predictive validity. It corresponds with dopamine D2 blockade in the uh, sort of the ventral striatal regions. And it's just is something that we've always used over the years. Um, we've been working with a, a company called Corona Therapeutics who actually have a phase three molecule. This is a novel treatment for schizophrenia based off muscarinic agonist um, activation. And we've shown that this compound has a, basically an a, a antipsychotic like profile. And it has effects where it's basically wiping out avoidance responses, but it doesn't have motor side effects. So the animals still have the ability to escape the shock very quickly. So, and we've been using this to actually show that there's actually synergy between existing medications such as risperidone, aripiprazole, say at low doses, you give zonomaline on top of that, you have greater than additive responses on this avoidance response. So it's been a sort of a drug development tool for us as well. Now the video tracking lab, um, again, this is a very versatile system. We, we use it for various uh, cognitive as well as uh, sort of anxiety assays. Current mazes that we have, we have a Y maze, um, which you see down below. And it basically can track where the animal goes. You can do heat maps or line tracing, and we can measure time spent in each of the arms. So we look at spontaneous alternation as a kind of a, a measure of working memory. Um, we have a Morris water mace uh, for mice. This is a, a, a very traditional um, spatial learning and memory task. Basically, you're using uh, sort of colder water as an escape reinforcer. Um, we have a eight-arm radio maze shown below. This can be used in various ways. We can actually use it, uh, uh, put food at the end of the arms, and it's basically a food reinforced task. Or the other way that's actually been more effective in mice for us is we, again, create an environment where we have bright lights. We actually have a, a fans blowing, creating sort of this, this breeze across there, and it drives an escape behavior. So basically one of these arms actually is open. The others are kind of blocked off, and they can actually go in and escape to uh, this little escape hatch that has their home shavings in there. And they actually learn this pretty well. So you can use spatial cues to, to drive this behavior. Again, we're using different sort of reinforcers to um, that's more amenable for different types of animals. And, and one assay that I'll talk a little bit more about is this active place avoidance task. So this task is, is very interesting that we have this circular chamber that rotates. We can kind of specify the, the rate of rotation and it sits on the shock grid. And this is where it requires an interaction between the hardware here and the software of any maze. 
And what we can do with the NMA software is we create what we call a virtual shock zone. So as the animal sort of crosses into this shock zone, it will trigger the, the floor to emit a, a foot shock. So the animal then escapes it. So one thing that's really kind of nice about this, and one of the problems we have with assays like um, water maze, uh, radio mazes, is sometimes you get animals that just don't want to participate. You know, they'll, in a water maze, they may just decide to float around. In a radio maze, they just say, well, I'm not really interested in food. Well, the fact that here, that they, if they don't move, the, the maze rotates and they'll actually go into the shock zone at some point. So it does create this need for behavior. And it's been thought to have kind of different advantages over some of the other assays of spatial, uh, of spatial learning. You know, this isn't dependent on food motivation, such as the radio maze tasks often are. This is a bit lower stress. They've actually done studies where they've looked at uh, ACTH or corticosterone levels showing that, you know, when the animal can actually avoid a mild shock, it's not that stressful. So this has some advantages, whereas if you're giving heavy shock, you know, you cause a stress response that might interfere with cognition. And if you might have a genotypic interaction with that as well. And I like how it's flexible that we can alter the task uh, difficulty. You know, we can increase the speed of the rotation. We can change the salience of the extra maze cues. And we can look at within session learning versus across days. We can look at what we call higher order conditioning. So once they learn a task of where this, you know, where in this, uh, may, in this uh, environment do they need to avoid, now we change the location. So that becomes very difficult for them to do. And it's just to show some typical data. We can look at total shocks. This shows latency to first shock. This shows these are just C57 black six J mice showing a basically over days, they get better at avoiding that first shock. And, and this is one of the things, this is where um, our, our technician, Tim Meyer, really kind of observed that sometimes though, we get animals that have a lot of, that receive a lot of shocks. We don't know why. With the any maze, we can actually do a deeper dive into the data. And we actually discover, and we actually see this as a function of genotype sometimes, that the coping strategy can be different. Now, here's an animal that, you know, I don't know what day this was, but they only received two shocks during the day. And what we did is we created a heat map. So here is the shock zone right here. Again, so you got cues kind of predicting where, where the, the shock zone is. And the maze is, uh, the, is moving counterclockwise. And what we can see here, this mouse is pretty good at avoiding the shocks. They spend most of their times almost on the opposite side. So they're kind of down here. So they, when they go in there, they know to run over here to get away from it. And they kind of just move enough to stay over here. Now here's a mouse that didn't do so well. This mouse actually got a lot of shocks and their strategy was very different they would actually hang out just outside of the zone. So they would sit here and stop. They go rotate into the zone, they get shocked and they move just out. So they're, they're basically reacting to, to the shock. They're not using the extra maze cues to learn where it is and to avoid it. So these type of behaviors can be sort of tracked by looking at the, the data in more, um, in, in more detail. And, and it actually, you know, if you have a, a mouse that, uh, say a knockout or a transgenic is exhibiting this type of behavior, we can't actually get a good measure of cognition because their strategy is very different. Um, another piece of equipment that we have is uh, our startle apparatus. Basically, we have six of these boxes that the, uh, have these tubes that are built for mice or rats, so the different sizes. Uh, they, they rest on this uh, piezo accelerometer, which is a force transducer. So every time the animal sort of pushes down or jumps within there, and again, this isn't restraint stress. The animal can turn around freely in here. It's generally kept quite uh, very uh, dark in here, or we can actually, we have this LED panel where we can turn the light up if we want to create a maybe a more anxious environment. We can actually put uh, a half moon uh, shock grid in here to look at uh, fear potential startle, which is a classical conditioning um, you know, cognition model. Or one thing we've used is to use this to look at nociceptive processing. So here's a study we did in mice, kind of validating this idea is can we, you know, if we get a novel mouse, we want to make sure before we do these complicated uh, cognitive tests, do they hear normally? You know, do they, do they perceive 
um, you know, sensory process, you know, they, if, if you're using shock, do they perceive the shock the same way? Because that could actually affect your readout. So one thing we do is we put them in and within the same session, uh, we actually do a acoustic uh, pulse. These are like 40 millisecond pulses of different uh, intensities. And you get this nice sort of gradient uh, intensity induced increase in startle response. And on other trials, we give a, you know, starting pretty low intensity foot shocks. And we look at what is the threshold where they start to show a, a shock flinch. And here we did a shock, no shock, because one thing we didn't want to show is if they're getting foot shock, is it going to alter their response to the acoustic pulses? This just shows that it did not. So it makes us feel better that we're not confounding our sort of acoustic uh, processing versus the nociceptive processing. And this was actually used by uh, Katie Reeves in uh, Dr. Brady Atwood's lab. So they had a, a, a mouse that lacked myopoid receptors on the V-glute neurons. And they used it in two ways. One is to show that their knockout mouse had normal nociceptive processing to the shock flinch. They didn't look any different from their knockouts. And then they also looked at it pharmacologically to see, well, does, does oxycodone have a different uh, analgesic profile in here? And there was no, no change. It was uh, this kind of dropped down a little bit, but there was no difference between knockout and controls in terms of their response to oxycodone. So suggesting anyway that that um, these particular mice did not have deficits in sensory processing or altered response to the analgesic effects of an opioid agonist. Now, another piece of equipment that has tremendous potential for different types of paradigms is a telemetry system that we got from TSC Systems. And um, here's our setup. We have 16 cages. This is for mice at the moment. They also have rat-sized ones that could be that could be uh, bought and used. So these are 16 cages, and this is kind of what they look like. Uh, we don't have this is a tube that measures body weight continuously, but instead of this, we have uh, three sort of sensors: one for food, two for liquids that rest in here, and they're basically force transducers. So every time the animal eats or licks, and we can look at this in, you know, uh, 15 second in increments, 15 minute, one hour. And again, we can, we can do this continuously, break down the data however we want, so we can get real time uh, data. We can look at bout drinking, bout eating, you know, what time of day are they, are they doing these behaviors? We ha actually have a will in here that's very useful that we can change the um, resistance of it. So, you find that if it's real easy, say you have an animal that has maybe a, a chronic pain sort of perturbation that you've, you've used, they may run quite readily when it moves very easily, but as you increase that resistance, are they going to stop sooner or faster or the bouts going to be slower? Um, so we use that and we have the ability to use uh, telemetry as well, where we can implant different types of biosensors. Uh, right now, we've been primarily looking at body temperature and activity, but they also, uh, it's a different type of surgery, different type of electrodes, but we can look at heart rate, blood pressure, we can do EEG, EMGs, and so forth. So this is all going on at the same time. So the amount of data that you can actually acquire um, in the readouts at the same time is, is quite impressive. Um, so this is a system like if you just have a novel mouse, you don't know what to expect of it or, or, or a new drug that you wanna assess this is a very nice way to see whether it has alterations in any of these behaviors. This is uh, some data that my student Omar El Jordi created, just showing, you know, in a normal mouse, you know, what does their running patterns look like? And basically, you know, over 95% of their running activity occurs during the dark cycle. So this would be useful, for example, if you have a mouse that maybe you think has a circadian rhythm disruption. So uh, we can look at this and again, you get this very typical uh, high activity in the early phase, then they kind of rest. And just before the lights come on, they have another uh, bout of running. And this kind of corresponds with their food intakes as well. This just shows their, this is a cumulative plot. So basically you can look at this sort of the slope as the, how much they're eating. You can tell during the light, they're not eating or drinking very much. So this is something that we use quite frequently. Um, some general pieces of equipment we have uh, to look at reflexive motor autonomic 
Uh, this is all part of our frailty assessment. So we have a uh, sort of a objective measure of looking at uh, sort of measured in newtons. You know how how hard do you have to pull the mouse by the base of the tail for them to let go of the of the of the grid or the bar? We can do you know front legs, all four legs, and this is some data that uh, Hanika Patel, a student, and and mine and Christian's Lasagna Reeves lab, looking at the these are a talopathy mouse. Um, this is uh, front paw grip strength. You can see that these mice aren't as aren't able to hold on as, as robustly. This kind of fits with a general frailty phenotype that they exhibit. Um, another motor coordination, a very traditional assay, is rotor rod. So these are um, from Omnitech as well that we can look at. These are individual. So we can change the size of the bars uh, for mice or rats. Um, and there's different paradigms we can look at. We can change the, the basically, these are accelerating uh, rotor rods. So part of the training is we can put it at a very static low speed. So they learn it really well. And then we can have it accelerate at whatever rate we want. So what point do they eventually fall off? And this is just some data with old and young mice showing that you know as, as, as the mice age, their motor coordination isn't as robust. And, and one thing I, I, I would like to emphasize with this behavioral technology is, again, integration. Let's say you're an individual lab and you're interested more in you know, pathological or biochemical endpoints. So we can work with you to profile your, your mouse or your rat in these behavioral assessments. And then we can work with you either within our labs we, we can you know, take the animals down, we can perfuse, take out target organs, uh, fluid, whatever you want, whatever your measures are, or we can transfer back to your labs as well. But this is a, a study where uh, we were work with Hanika working in, within a behavioral core and uh, Kristen was on a Reeves lab. We did, she did all these behavioral assessments in these PS19 mice at an age where they're known to have pretty robust talopathy uh, markers, okay? That there's uh, starting to develop neurofibrillar tangles, uh, a lot of astrogliosis, all these sort of measures. Because uh, by, by a year of age, they actually start to die. So this is getting pretty late into their pathology. It just shows here that multiple measures of what we would call you know, vitality of the mice differ between wild type and PS19, which, which is very nice. It's, it's very useful data to have this behavioral endpoints. But she took it a step further and actually did a, a, a pretty in-depth profile look at sort of markers of, of phospho uh, tau markers, looked at uh, microglia response, uh, astroglia responses, inflammation markers. And what was interesting from this paper that she just published was that certain behaviors tended to correlate better with different sort of, uh, sort of biochemical endpoints. For example, the hyperactivity that she saw in the PS19 mouse, and then she, and these are my, and the same mouse actually looked at GFAP, which is uh, markers of astrocytes. There is a, a significant correlation between how hyper the mice were and how intense the GFAP intensity was. And what was also interesting is that different behaviors correlated better with different sort of biochemical or pathological endpoints. And I think that's a very important point to make. You know, a lot of Alzheimer's models, especially amyloid models, you know, they, they say that these, like a 5X fad mouse has a cognitive uh, disruption that's assumed to be due to amyloidosis. However, when, you know, those few studies that actually correlated within the same animal the behavior and the pathology endpoint, there's rarely a good correlation there. So to me, this you know, shows you that behavior actually may be related to a particular you know, biochemical process. So where are we at now is we're, we're still developing and validating these new assays, basically as needed by our partners. Again, so again, that first slide I showed you all these different sort of capabilities we have. What we've been doing as, as there's a need and as we talk with investigators, we actually set up a testing plan, develop new assays, we'll validate them, 
and, and test. And, and, and it's one thing that's very important is, you know, we, we kind of do this all on a C57 Black 6J mouse because that, that oftentimes, I say 90% of the time, that is the strain that is used for a lot of genetic manipulations. However, sometimes they may be on a mixed background or an outbred background. And we really need to do that basic behavior in that original, original strain because they're going to be very different. And, and the endpoints for a C57 Black 6 mouse may not be the same that we want to use for an outbred mouse. We, we work, I'd say if we were to map out, we work primarily with neuroscience uh, related investigators so far. However, we do have the cap capability and we're trying to increase our capacities. I'm hoping this sort of uh, you know, seminar across different institutions, you know, whether you work in musculoskeletal, musculoskeletal diabetes or oncology areas, you know, there are assays that we can develop. You know, we, um, talking with investigators about, you know, are you working with chemotherapy-induced neuropathies? You know, can we look at different pain or functional readouts? So we're trying to be more receptive to developing new assays in this space. You know, the, the integration of new technologies could be useful, you know, with, with uh, micro, you know, uh, miniaturization of equipment, you know, can we put, you know, uh, calcium sensors into the brain? We, we can, you know, uh, Brady Atwood and Patrick Sheets Labs can you do uh, wireless uh, optogenetics, which is be much more conducive to doing behavioral work. So again, can we incorporate new technologies into our standard assays to kind of give us a, breader, a greater breadth of, of assessment? And as I said, we're, we're, we're getting pretty adept at doing necropsy type of endpoints. And so not only with the individual investigator, but another thing with the CTSI or, or other school cores is, you know, now you can maybe, and one thing we're actually trying to do is talk with sort of partner cores like in the neuroscience building, Brady Atwood's lab has a, a electrophysiology core. Eric Engelman has a neurochemistry core that do microdialysis. Um, and there's also all the different omics, you know, cores that you can do. So I would encourage investigators to talk not only with us, but with other sort of cores where we could send, you know, the animals or the tissue samples to do that fully integrated multidisciplinary uh, uh, sort of analysis of, of your animal. And the other thing that I think is important as we build this basic sort of scaffold of, of behavioral assessments is now we can sort of overlay different perturbations. You know, we, we're, we're doing some work with uh, cytobiosciences on the microbiome and what the effects could be. We know that, you know, uh, diabetes is a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. So what are the effects of high fat diets on a you know, an amyloid or tau uh, Alzheimer's mouse, you know, drug dependence, you know, looking at withdrawal with these different measures, you know, TBI, concussion, brain injuries, different pain states. I mean, you know, there's over 130 different pains, human pain conditions. And I think one of the things when I was in industry, we always struggled with is, you know, you have a drug that appears to be analgesic, what indication do you take it into the clinic? Do we look at visceral pain? Do we look at inflammatory pain, uh, you know, neuropathic pain? And the, the choice of your clinical trial may mean the, uh, you make the difference whether it's successful or not. So having different sort of you know, pain perturbation models, whether it's chemotherapy-induced neuropathies, you know, uh, you know, using inflammatory or, or nerve ligation models, they could be very important in, in sort of applying that therapeutically. And also, you know, pathological uh, seeding models, you know, um, with Alzheimer's disease, working with Dr. Adrian O'Black's lab, where we take human tau seeds and inject them into uh, to the mouse brain, we can look at perturbations that accelerate pathology, as well as having uh, behavioral deficits. So again, there's a lot of things that we can continue to grow. What we've tried to do in the first uh, three years, I guess, that, that we've had the course set up is have a, a nice battery of assays that have a good baseline, but also thinking about the future and bringing in new technology that we can use on top of that or new, entire, new, new technology entirely. So uh, this is kind of where we're at. And I encourage, uh, if you have any questions about what we can do, if you have an idea, a particular assay you wanna try, please reach out to myself or Katie through our emails I showed you. Uh, we also have a, a uh, website um, as well as a uh, iLabs. If you're an iLab user, 
you can contact us through that as well. So with that, I will end and see if there are, are any questions. That's great, Dave, thanks so much. It really sounds like there's some great opportunities uh, to, for people to incorporate your uh, services into their own research. So just a couple questions, and if people want to go ahead and ask their own, just turn on your camera or raise your virtual hand and, and we'll call on you to unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh, the first question was, it's an important question. Um, you talked about rates in the beginning um, and someone is asking, um, is, do you charge the same rates for non-IU labs? Yeah, that's it. So IU labs are, are, you know, roughly 50 an hour. It's, it's for non IU labs, academic would be uh, 75 an hour and you know, like biotech it, it's, it's more. So there is a, there is, cause the, the reason for that is we're a um, IU school course. So we're actually subsidized uh, by the, the, the Dean's office on that. So that's a different, that's why that rate is a little bit lower. So maybe just clarify about CTSI institutions. Are they getting the IU rate or? It's a good question, Notre actually. Dame, Bloomington. Yeah, I think, you know, now that we're part of the CTSI, that makes sense that we would have the same rate. So yeah, if you're part of the CTSI, that would fit as well. Great. Um, Luke, would you like me to read your question or would you like to ask it yourself? Uh, I can I can ask it. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Fantastic. Uh, thanks, David. That was a really exciting presentation. Lots of different exciting assays to work with. Um, in terms of the different assays, like in your experience, are the sample numbers that you need to power these experiments fairly consistent, or do they vary based on the phenotype of the models that you're working with? And if that is the case, um, do you need preliminary data to sort of be able to tell us whether or not it's worth pursuing the experiments or not? That's a great question, Luke. Um, in general, um, you know, now things like autonomic endpoints tend to be tighter and, and also the design, if you're using a repeated measure design, you know, you have a lot more statistical power. But in general, you know, ends of eight to 12 for I'd say majority of behaviors is, is gonna be appropriately powered. Now that said, if you have a very subtle, you know, sort of, uh, you know, gene manipulation effect, if your effect size, again, that's how you're know, calculating your power analysis, if you have an effect size that's very modest, you know, we will need more animals. So, so what we have is we would base our initial power assessment based off, you know, the, the sort of assays that we've run already. But if it's a brand new assay, this is where I kind of said earlier that It'd be nice to do some pilot work just to get an idea of the sense of variability that we have. Um, you know, obviously, exploratory activity is going to be more variable than something where you have an uh, animal that has been trained operantly. So, so I would say it varies a little bit, but in general, and, I was, and, and again, are you looking at sex differences? I, you know, males and females, um, if you really want to power to see sex differences, you got to take that into account. So, we generally you know, as minimum for most assays, you want to at least have ends of eight per genotype, per sex, per, per treatment. But, but again, that with that caveat, you know, if you have a lot of variability in the assay, you, you would want more. That sounds familiar. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Maybe while you're thinking of your questions, I, I, I'll go ahead and ask. Um, I know you do a lot of training for, uh, let's say, graduate students who are doing animal studies in their uh, thesis projects. Um, maybe you want to talk a little bit about how that would how that would work. Yes. Yeah, so, so again, it's it's really easy for you know uh, investigators within the Stark, but even if you're you know off campus, if you have a student or yourself or a postdoc we can uh, actually have you come in and Katie or Tim will, will train you on a particular piece of equipment. So where, where it's really been nice is, you know, uh, we have a lot of the graduate students within the med neuro program that they want to actually do the behavior for their project. So we, we, again, the one thing we want is to make sure that you're running the assay the way we run it, you know, proper care, the equipment, you want, you know, equipment to break and things like that. So once you're well-trained, uh, Tim Meyer kind of organizes the schedule and you can come in and actually use the equipment for that. So we're not a, it's not an open access lab where you just sign up for time and come in, but 
for, for particularly for students, uh, we encourage that if this is good for your career development, we'll train you on the different techniques that you can incorporate into your work. Okay, that's great. Um, anyone else questions? I don't have any, I don't see any more. Yeah. Any uh, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I got a question, uh, perhaps very naive to Dave. Uh, so to evaluate the phenotype for Alzheimer disease, uh, what is the minimal uh, number of experiments we should do? Or if we want to do a more complete study, uh, what is the maximum number of animal behavior experiments should we propose? Yeah, it's, a, it's a good question, Tao. Um, it really depends on how characterized is your mouse. If you're using a you know, a well-studied transgenic, you know, 5X FAD, PS19 mouse, we, you, and, and you really want to look at a, you know, say a motor or a cognitive endpoint, now, take cognition. I would say you, you would, you know, want to have more than one assessment. So you might, you know, have a spatial learning task. Maybe you'd have a working memory, you know, so I would say, you, you know, it, it gives you better translatability, better generalizability if you can show a, a particular deficit within a domain such as cognition on multiple tests. Now, on the other hand, if you have a mouse model that's very new, I would say we need more behaviors to just, as I said, to rule out that, you know, the mouse, if you want cognition as an endpoint, make sure it doesn't have any sensory or motor deficits that might confound our interpretation of the cognitive score. So again, I'm kind of saying it kind of depends, you know, on what your endpoint is, how well characterized is your model. But I think for most grants and papers, you know, just having one measure of, of say cognition, you know, you, you don't know how well that is sort of generalizable to, to other assays or to other model systems. All right. Uh, so if for one assay, uh, if the sample, uh, for example, n equals eight, um, what is the price range for those kind of experiments for IU investigator? So, so what I what I do tell is we, we kind of we, we have to base it off sort of uh, how much time either our, our staff or we're using the equipment per hour. So, you know, like any a given assay, I can't say a price It's based off how many animals you're going to have. So let's say you have, uh, you know, three genotypes, you have a, a het knockout and a wild type, you want to look at males and females, you know, so that's six groups right there, times eight, you know, it's 48 animals. So I, I would go from there and that'd be for, for whatever assay. And, and some assays are very quick. You know, with our open field, we have six chambers. So we can do six mice at a time. Let's say it's a, you know, 30, 45 minute assessment. So that can be very quick. Now, if we're going to do a spatial learning task where, you know, the animal is trained every single day, those are going to be a bit more expensive. And, and things like the home cage telemetry, because the animals are actually living in those cages, we kind of have a kind of a different, almost like a daily rate with that to make it very cost effective. Um, so, so again, it kind of depends on the assays that we do. And we often will do a battery of assays. You know, like I said, you, you're not just having a single um, you know, motor or a single sensory test, we'll look at different things as well. So this is where we would talk about it and I can actually generate a quote that kind of itemized based off the time. You know, are there any additional supplies, any drugs we need to buy for pharmacology and so forth? All right, thank you. Thanks, Thanks Tal. Um, Kate, would you like to ask your question? Yes, thank you. Um, so if we already have a specific mouse model that we're working with, could we send you the mice for those experiments or do you guys do any breeding in-house and we could send you breeding pairs? Um, Please explain. Yeah, it could be done either way. Um, oftentimes for um, you know, other buildings or other campuses, um, you would just, you know, we would do a, a protocol transfer over to our space and we would do the behavior. And again, if, if, if we can't, if it's very particular uh, sort of uh, post-mortem endpoints where you need the animals back, we can ship them back or we can We've had, uh, we can do it, or we've had the investigators actually come over to our facilities and do the necropsy work. Um, that's if you have a, you know, say one cohort of animals. Now, to your other point, if you wanted to uh, have us look at these over time and we, you're actually breeding them over there, 
we could do that as well. It'd just be, you know, the per diem charges would go to your um, account, but that can be done. So we're pretty flexible in terms of how these studies can be done. Does that That's help? fantastic. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, Luke, you have another question? I do, sorry. Um, so, uh, like, uh, out of all of the different sort of assays that you offer, I imagine that, uh, how to put it, um, how many can be done back to back and how many needs to be done in isolation to prevent, like, you know, the effects of training or exposure having effects on other subsequent experiments? That's a, that's a very good question, Luke. Um, so generally when we have a, a battery, you know, we, we start with the most uh, non-invasive tests. You know, maybe we do something like, you know, elevated plus maze is a five minute test because you're, you're pointing out that you can have potential carryover effects. The last assay we might do might be one involving shock or something like that to look at uh, fear conditioning or something like that. Those will often be an endpoint assay. And I, I do recommend, let's say we do a battery of assays. Let's say we see some very interesting phenotypes one way to confirm that phenotype is to get another cohort of animals and, and do a very specific test in that assay. So we do that a lot. That gives us a lot of comfort that one, it's reproducible, the, the phenotype that we saw, and that we're controlling for those you know, potential carryover effects. Because that is a very real concern. But it, you know, again, you gotta be pragmatic. It's, you know, it's, it's a lot of, uh, you know, as much as it is a, a cost to breed animals, I would love to have a, a separate cohort for every assay we do, but that's just not you know, feasible. So we do what we can, but those are recommendations we would have is before you, you know, publish this, maybe we do a replication in a, in a naive group to confirm that phenotype. I'm a huge fan of replication, so that sounds fantastic. Thank you. It makes us all feel better. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Don't see any. So if not, thank you very much again, Dave. It was a great talk. Oh, great conversations, uh, great questions. And uh, we will see you guys all in two weeks, hopefully. All right. Thank you, everyone.